Erin Alberti. I'm a reporter with Axios. Uh, we just launched a Salt Lake City newsletter. So if you're in the 801 or the 435, definitely consider subscribing. Um, but right now we are here with Christina. Um, as was introduced, founded the company Vanta in 2018 to develop tools to help startups automate compliance for security and privacy. And so today we're going to talk about what startups can do um, to keep moving forward even when fundraising is thin and the financing markets are a little bit slow. Now, the reason that Vanta is an interesting case study for this is that they've actually had a lot of forward momentum as um, finance markets have been kind of not so great this year. They became a unicorn this summer, 2022. And with $110 million Series B in June, woo, I, I don't know if we can compete with that. I don't know what's going on over there. We're going to try our best. Um, with $110 million Series B in, in June, Vanta accomplished the bulk of its fundraising in this mostly fro frozen tech financing market. And <laughs> I hope you can hear my questions. Uh, it has more than tripled its customer base in the past year. And this week, uh, the company just announced that they are expanding internationally. So today, we're going to talk about how to make it in this new environment and how to control costs without compromising vision um, and identifying some new metrics that could help uh, secure some investor confidence that might be lacking right now. So Christina, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. So first, tell us about Vanta. What mm -hmm. problem were you trying to solve when you began? What is the company doing now? Yeah, so Vanta automates security and compliance for quickly growing companies. So what that looks like is we'll start working with a company often when it's quite young, like anywhere from literally two founders to a couple hundred employees. And there's sort of two things we help them with. The first one is we help them figure out what they need to do to kind of have good security. Like what does good security mean to your company? So we'll help them figure that out and set that up. And then once they have some baseline level of security, we help them go demonstrate that. So through compliance certifications, stuff like SOC 2 or HIPAA or GDPR, like there's a whole alphabet soup of stuff there you may have heard of. Um, and largely to build trust with their customers so they can keep growing their businesses. So really broadly, we help companies get secure and then demonstrate that security to their customers so they're more trustworthy. So when you guys started in 2018, um, there there was a lot of pressure to demonstrate growth quickly. How did that, I guess, help develop the market for your products? Yeah, so the, the kind of origin story of Vanta, or part of the founding story, is initially we were kind of just a security product. And we're based in San Francisco, and so we literally walked up and down the streets of downtown San Francisco and went to startups and said, hey, we can help you get more secure. Aren't you excited? And basically what people said back was like, yeah, we're excited, but also like I got a bunch of other stuff going on. Right? Like, I know I should stop and like make my company secure, but I have to build features for a new customer. I need to build something so this like big customer doesn't churn and go away. Right? I need to do all this stuff to keep growing because if my startup stops growing, I like, you know, it's kind of game over. I'm out of business. Anyway, so when we just went to them and we're like, hey, we'll just make you secure and won't that make you like feel good, basically? Founders were like, it would make me feel good, but then my, I worry about my business, right? Like, I, I can't prioritize that. So then what we realized was compliance, which kind of often, I think previously, it seemed like this kind of dirty word and this, like, task no one wanted to do, was actually this really uh, neat opportunity to build trust with customers. And if you, like, were secure and then went and demonstrated that security to your customers, that, was, like, that actually built trust with them and helped companies sell to regulated industries, healthcare, fintech, sold to big enterprises, right? The way a small startup seems like they're like kind of not ready for it. And so to your point, like our pitch became, hey, we still want to help you be secure, but then we're going to help you grow your business. And that was just much more resonant. And we kind of got customers and just even folks working with us early much more quickly because we were able to tie to their growth. Right. Now, so... After graduating from Y Combinator in 2018, you didn't seek funding for another three years, not yeah. until, what, spring of last year. So what exactly was happening in the meantime? Yeah, so, to, so Vanta, so we, we, as you mentioned, went through YC, got, had raised $3 million seed round, 
And then we didn't raise until we were $10 million in revenue and ARR. And that's like not super common, but the reason we were able to do that was because we, we were trying to build a business, which I know sounds kind of silly, but sort of in a couple senses. One, um, I was fortunate to start my career at an early stage venture capital firm like a decade plus ago. And one of the things I learned there was like the best way to get a VC to want to fund your business is to not need their funding. Right. And so if you can like build a business that does not need them, they want to give you all of the money. And so like kind of counterintuitively, the best way to get VCs to want to fund Banta was to not need it. And so there were just like a bunch of benefits from that. Right. It also kind of forced us to think about, do we have a good business? We couldn't be like, oh, we have a good business because this VC said we do. Right. It's like, no, no, no. Like, what's our kind of internal sense of this? And it also forced us to like deliver a good service for customers because if you don't do that, right, they won't keep spending money with you and then, you know, that doesn't work. And so it just kind of enforced a lot of rigor in the company at an early stage that I think really benefited us later on. All of that said, the, the goal is and was very much to build a, like a very large, sustainable, long lasting tech company with Vanta. And so it was always kind of a like, when question of when we would go raise money, not if we would. I feel like a ton of respect for the bootstrapping community and like micro entrepreneurs. Um, didn't want that with Vanta, but I think there were a lot of kind of tactics from there we took. And so last kind of uh, January, February, really, January, February 2021, we kind of hit $10 million in revenue. We were starting to see a little bit more noise on our market. And so it seemed like the time to go out and raise for, for kind of the first round of institutional funding. It's kind of funny how you took this very conservative approach to growth early on um, while the pressure to grow is what's creating the market for your product. Um, in, in 2021, when you went and sought funding, things were a lot more flush than they are now. Mm -hmm. How did investors react to kind of your conservative approach? Were they weirded out by it or was it just kind of like, well, it seems okay. Yeah, a little bit. So this was like January, 2021. So like very much all over Zoom, like, I don't know, kind of coming out of deep COVID, but like most people hadn't had, you know, vaccines yet. Things were still pretty locked up. And I think some of the, the investors we were talking to knew about Vanta, but they had no idea we were a $10 million revenue company at that point. And then you kind of put up the, you know, I'd have this slide deck, right? Your pitch deck and like the first slides were story slides and People would kind of nod, and then I put up this revenue chart. And the revenue chart was, you know, 2018, we went, 2019, we basically went from 200K to 2 million. And in 2020, we went from basically from 2 to 10 million in revenue. And people were just like, what? <laughs> like, where did you come from? Like, I did not think you were that big. Like, I thought you were this, you know, cute little seed stage startup that was like maybe 200K in revenue. Um, and so they were kind of funny conversations because you were like, uh, well, uh, would you like me to talk through the revenue numbers, like VC? You know, like kind of what do you say next? Um, so yes, people were, you know, I think maybe had heard of us, but did not think we were at the scale we were at at that point. And what is normally the threshold that people start seeking their um, Series A at? Yeah, I think like the the kind of metrics that get tossed around are like one to two million dollars in revenue. And so again, it was like, oh, maybe Vanta's around there. As you accumulated for a really, really long time before kind of moving forward with that. Um, now, you said since then, since last May, uh, you've found investors to be a lot more interested in seeing proof of more disciplined spending. And can you tell us about some of the new metrics that have proven to be a bit more important than they were even just a year ago? Yeah, so in kind of 2021, and I sort of alluded to this, but it, like it's all about revenue growth, right? Like how quickly are you growing ARR? And like kind of, you know, we'll ask about other things, but like really it's just that. And when we went out and raised this spring, so kind of April, May 2022, when like ice had already started to melt, it was very different. And there were a lot more questions about how efficiently we were spending and how efficiently we were growing. And sort of the canonical metric ended up being um, burn ratio, which is just this measure of for every dollar you're spending as a company, how many dollars of revenue are you bringing in, right? And Vanta had kind of traditionally done very well on that metric back to the early days, but 
for most companies, and especially in 2021, and of the environment, it was a lot of like, hey, spend seven dollars today for you know one dollar revenue today, but like don't worry, you'll make it up later. And there was just like no tolerance for that. This spring, this spring, it's like one dollar out for one dollar in, like maybe one point two, you know, a dollar twenty out, a dollar in, but like no more, no more. Get that under control. So it's super different. Now, as things have has slowed down a bit in terms of financing availability and, and there being a lot more demanding is to see that, that their money will be used efficiently. Um, do you think that a lot of startups, do they know that that's expected now? And is the big step going to be showing investors that they can be thrifty or is it going to be a bigger step to just like actually be thrifty? I think it's like much more actually be thrifty. So in terms of how, how much folks know, I don't know, you all in the audience actually probably have better sense. I think, you know, if you joking and not, if you like read, you know, VCs on Twitter, or, like listen to VC podcasts, like there's a lot of talk and chatter about these things. If your head's down building your business, like, you know, you're not, you're not reading VC Twitter. And so it's, it's sort of that, I think. Um, I think though in even one-on-one -on -one conversations, VCs are very quick to reference these things. And to the second part of your question, what I've found is, uh, you know, if you could say 2021 was all about kind of in a good way, like hopes and dreams, and here's all like the magic things we can do if we like hire more people at the company and invest, and you know we'll launch these cool new products and they'll do all these amazing things. 2022, you can like say all that, and people are like, cool, that sounds good. Let me know. Come back after you've launched them and the amazing things have happened, right? Because I'm like not going to give you credit for stuff you haven't done. So it's so great you have that wonderful vision. Let's talk when you have the metrics, and so just like very different. That makes it really hard if you're if you had your idea today. Yes. That's a, that's a different story. Um, now, talking about thrift, I, I guess, can you think of some expenses that in the industry are seen as kind of necessary, but that maybe actually might not be? Yeah, we're talking about this. this is a lot of kind of funny, I think probably in Utah, you, you have, have this better, bit better under control than Silicon Valley, like classically. But, you know, certainly pre-pandemic, right? Like I worked at a tech company that hired many private chefs and we had like three meals every day made by private chefs at the company. It was great as an employee, but like, <laughs> but like, was that why I worked there, right? Like, was that, you know, and, and how expensive was that? Like, you know, and, and just kind of exorbitant office space and like getting them the like San Francisco startup trope of like exposed brick and like, furniture from design within reach and you know like everything very 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 nice and that's lovely but I think the pandemic you know chipped away at some of that some of that still remains I think what's um an interesting navigation for companies that grew up during the pandemic Vanta very much included is given so many people are remote and are like you know kind of forming work relationships via zoom squares but like we all know that's desperately not the same thing as what it used to be. Um, how do you think about offsites as a company, right? We can all agree like, oh, we want to get people together and whether it's a specific team or cross teams or the whole company, but then there's just a whole range of ways to do that from, you know, having everyone, you know, come to an office and like kind of work together, but like work on the company for a couple of days to having everyone go to Park City, you know, up down the road and like ski together for a couple of days. And obviously there's a lot in between those two poles, but I think you can, those kind of decisions are uh, obviously like uh, impact how much you spend on these things, but they're just thinking like, every company is sort of navigating that and making different decisions there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like you want to be competitive when it comes to recruiting, um, but especially it seems like in a work from home universe that a lot of the the things that cost a lot of money to make it seem like you're a place of luxury um, to the, some of that maybe more image related stuff, it just kind of falls away when people have been zooming in their pajama pants for two and a half years. Um, you know, I, I know that I went from a legacy newspaper, like a hundred year old newspaper to Axios this year. And even that cultural difference in terms of like, you know, we have a, a conference, everybody's super stoked to get together. We haven't seen each other. We haven't met each other in a lot of cases. And the being there was the fun part. And then they gave us all like um, t-shirts and uh, picnic blankets and caps and mugs and beer koozies. Um, and I was like, okay, well, I got like super excited because I'm like, oh, I have my stuff. But then I was like, oh, like, 
how many hundreds of people and how many $5 per t-shirt that says like this conference label on it. And I was like, oh, I think I would like a raise in <laughs> right. instead of the t-shirt. But, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting cultural shift. I, I, I am kind of wondering, um, you know, what are some things that like during this time that you've found that you that you kind of made some some cuts at that were a little bit maybe nerve wracking or that you weren't sure if like this was going to actually make make people think like, oh, I don't know if I want to work there if they don't even do this. Yeah, it's like this whole kind of confidence thing. So we tried to always be kind of on the more kind of frugal, but like prudent side, like in the in pre-pandemic days, our like spending, our expense policy literally was pretend we're going to make you stand up in front of all 15 people who work at Vanta today and tell us what you just spent. And like, P.S., we won't actually make you do that, but like pretend we would. And so, you know, if you'd be embarrassed to say the thing, please don't spend the thing. Um, some of that scales, some of it doesn't. I think it's funny, swag is a good one, right? Like there's... And where we've actually netted out on that is like one or two really nice things where it's like kind of neat. It is neat when you get on a Zoom and like everyone kind of has the same Banta sweatshirt on. It's also a little weird, but like neat in a good way, but like not a t-shirt and a this and a that and a like pile box of stuff. Um, you know, office space, right? We have, an, we have offices in expensive cities, San Francisco and New York, but they're relatively small. And they're also... I mean, they're nice, but they're not, they're functional. Um, and that is somewhat a cost thing and somewhat like a culture thing. Uh, is like, you know, we want the offices to be productive places for people to do their jobs, to be very clear. But we don't have the like proverbial foosball tables or, or stuff like that in our offices. Do you think that, you know, in the past that, that pressure to, to sp spend and to even maybe seem spendy um, it seems like that's changing. I'm wondering, like, did you think that that's kind of a cultural shift that may have been overdue in the first place that maybe, you know, recruits, but potential employees are less impressed now by, like, this flashy, um, I mean, what, whatever way you can project that that may be, you know, painful for the bottom line. Uh, do you think that people just, employees would want different things now? Maybe. Like, I think we've always tried to, like, have the, again, like, you know, functional and nice but not super nice office. Or we do a bunch of research around compensation and employment and, like, pay people market rates for their roles but kind of not above and have a lot of confidence in where our, like, comp bands come out, things like that. I think the other places we've... I think it's especially important now when we're kind of selling a candidate, it's a lot of like, hey, here's Vanta's business metrics. Here's like the business opportunity or here's what we're building and the product opportunity, right? Versus like, and here are all the perks. And it's always like, we do have lots of, you know, perks in some sense, right? But we almost try to like meet the market and then take that off the table. So it is not the factor in which someone is making a decision. Um, and there's some amount of confidence. I think you, as a like, entrepreneur or founder you have to have in that because you're not you're not gonna or like my view is like you know we're not gonna be able to compete with like the goals of the world on some of these measures and so and if these measures are really important to people which they are for often good reasons like that is totally fair and this person should not work at Vanta, right and it's like best to figure that out now not in you know x months and I think it took me like a couple of years to sort of like come to terms with that reality and be like, ah, oh, we lost this person who I think is very talented, but like that, that is in fact like the universe has made the right outcome happen, even if I'm personally not like super thrilled with it. But that, that was an evolution for sure. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it does seem like you couldn't, I don't want to say fool, like that people are less easily fooled because I don't mean to say that people were fooled in the past, but that they've seen the splash at this point. We had like a couple decades of splash and may, maybe now, especially in a work from home era, it's like, no, I need to like what I'm working on. I need to have some faith that I have some job security at this place that they're not gonna have the doors shut suddenly one day and I need to be compensated fairly. Have 
yeah. you know, flexible work, whatever, the, the things that people want. I can see that changing pretty quickly, especially with the pandemic happening. Yeah. Do you think that, I mean, because that happened in 2020, that happened two years ago. You weren't even asking for funding then. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, did, did startups immediately see the opportunity to save there? Or has Opposite? it taken a longer than that? I don't know. I think pretty much in 2020, everyone was very like, spring of 2020, do I give up my office? Do I not? I mean, Vanta, we took on a new lease in April of 2020, which is just a great time to take on a larger <laughs> lease, right? And we actually could have gotten out of it, but we're like, no, nah, we'll be back by June. It's cool. Anyway, <laughs> flash forward. It's very nice to have the space now. But at that time, it was, it was right, that was kind of the like, oh, it's almost over time. And, you know, the answer was no in retrospect. But I think that was where it took a little bit longer for folks to figure out. And then, you know, and then we're, I think we're honestly all still figuring this out, right? Even companies that have gotten rid of offices now sometimes want them back or, you know, there's, there's a lot shaken out here still. Yeah. Now, you've attributed a lot of Vanta's stability today and ability to move forward today to some more cautious and disciplined choices made a few years ago, even when the environment didn't necessarily demand it. A lot of startups didn't go down that road. You know, they might have seen like, well, no, we need to demonstrate like growth. We need to demonstrate like a you know certain boldness or something to get investors' attention. Then, so how did start? How can startups that didn't start out in that kind of conservative, under the radar, modest way, yeah, um, you know, or even actively resisted that? How can they now credibly change gears? Do they, can they just not go back to the same well that they were promoting themselves to as this like, look at all our stuff. And yeah. now they've got to be like, look at how conservative we are. Yeah. It's like, how can they sell that to investors? Do they just need to go to new places or do they just need to start changing that burn rate? Yeah, I think, I don't know, maybe I'm overly idealistic about this, but I think, you know, this stuff is hard to change in a lot of ways. But if like, you know, the founder or the executive team or whoever wants to change it, you can totally do it, right? Uh, and so I think almost the first step of that is, does, again, founder, leadership team, decision-making body, whoever it is, sort of have conviction that they should go do all this stuff? And then can they go, and then there's like the change management piece, right? Can they explain that to the executive team, the other leaders, the folks at the company? And like, that stuff is all hard, but it is also all doable, right? And in some ways that kind of is the job at these levels, and so, Anyway, I think it's, it's very hard and also it's very doable. Um, and then in terms of investors, you know, I say this with deep love and I really like our investors. I think sometimes they kind of have the memories of goldfish and it's kind of great, right? Because it's like, oh, you know, I, I came to you at one point and I was singing a growth playbook and now I'm, or grow, grow, grow playbook, really. And now I'm coming to you and I have a playbook around responsible growth. And I think the investor would be like, that's great. It sounds like you're adapting to market conditions this is a positive sign, right? And so I think there actually is a lot of kind of leeway there in a, in a good way. Mm -hmm. Now, if that, I mean, that kind of addresses people that are already existing. If you had to start today in this climate, how would you make yourself competitive with investors? Well, um, the the YC tagline is just really good. The like build something people want. Which you're like, oh yeah, cool. That sounds obvious, and it's like so hard to do often. Um, but I think you know the fundamentals are are still the fundamentals, right? Investors want to fund businesses that seem like they will grow and scale in the long term, and so that's you know having customers that like the product and will like unprompted you know say that and vote with their time and their money. Um, in the early days, which is its own hard, as the company figures out kind of go to market, but like, cool, you have this product people like, how you get it out to lots and lots of people. Um, for the founder, like, how do you learn to hire lots of people and people who are different and more senior and more experienced and different skill set than you? And like, how do you do that, right? Like all of the kind of basics of startup creation and company building, I think still apply almost more so now than a year ago or so when it was, again, more kind of dreams and opportunity and like that. Right, right. Now, you are from Ohio. Proudly. So Midwest. I'm from Iowa. Do we have other Midwesterners here at all? 
Yay, we got one. <laughs> now, I know this is actually like a tough sell on this side of the Rockies, but Iowa and Ohio aren't actually the same state. That's true. Um, but you get us right with Idaho. Like, that's yeah, nice. Yeah, Everybody confuses that. me with Idaho here. That makes me happy. Um, but, you know, I think coming from the Midwest, um, I don't want to get too gunked up in stereotypes here, but do you think that your Midwestern background has shaped your kind of more conservative approach? You know, this emphasis on fiscal discipline, being a little bit more restrained, um, maybe a little more okay staying under the radar, or maybe either less enticed by or distracted by flash generally. Is this, were, were you born for this back in Columbus? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to say, right? Because I like don't know the, the counterfactual, but possibly, right? Like just uh, similar to Utah. They're very excited over there. But like, you know, Midwestern upbringing where like everyone, you know, it's kind of the classic like Midwestern work ethic and you just like work hard and like your job. And so that was kind of what I always expected. Um, I also do think there's a bit because like some of the like extravagance of the Bay Area and California and tech in the Bay Area. Uh, I mean, I've lived in the Bay Area for more than half my life at this point. So like, I, I get it and seen it. But there is a part where it just still feels a little funny to me. And I think it's just because I didn't grow up with these things. And so it is a little like, oh, do you really need, you know, I don't know, whatever extravagant thing like because I cause again, I just grew up around people who didn't have those things and were totally happy and wonderful. And so probably just like a little bit more skepticism of some of it. I think when I was, you know, preparing for this session, I don't have a background in tech journalism, actually. I do general news reporting. And as I was kind of reading about this shift in what investors want, and now you can't spend outside your means, and I was sitting there like, well, doesn't every kid that had allowance know that? Like, well, how is this groundbreaking? And I think that I didn't really understand the cultural pressure to appear you know, extravagant maybe, or to appear spendy as sort of a way, not, not just for the fun of it, but to gain the confidence of potential employees as well as investors. Um, is that like, that cultural impulse, was that gonna fade anyway, even if there hadn't been a, like a downturn in the markets? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I guess you know, the other way I've kind of looked at it is like, look, the, there's like an end goal here in North Star, kind of whatever you want to call it, right? And for us, it's, I mean, the company's mission is securing the internet and having this huge sense of helping companies get secure and demonstrate their security. And so hopefully everything we're doing is like a means to that end. And then again, maybe the like brick walled gorgeous office helps with that. But I think that's more debatable. Um, and so it's kind of that frame. I think last year, even when everything was like, go, 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 growth at all costs, um, you would hear people say, I mean, at the end and elsewhere, ooh, this like can't keep going. But by the way, I'm gonna like ratchet up another level, right? We're gonna like break the comp band for this person or this role, because like the job market is like so white hot. And oh, we can't keep breaking comp band, but by the way, I've moved the comp band up, you know, five times in the last year. And so like, there was a bit where you're like, at some point, everyone kind of, I think, knew like, the, the music would stop and like we'd have to like find chairs and you know and it wouldn't be sustainable yeah so I mean what kind this is kind of a situation where you I don't want to say separate the wheat from the chaff because the chaff includes a lot of like really really, really good ideas <laughs> really hard working people and, too yes. like, hard working people and yeah. things that aren't going to happen but you know this is a situation where there is sort of a sifting um, what are some things you think that all of the startups that end up not in the, you know, that end up yeah. surviving the sifting, what are some things that they probably all have in common? Oh, gosh. It's like, again, a product that, you know, folks want. Um, figuring out how to find talented folks who want to work for your company, right? And I, to me, the first step of that is being clear on sort of what company you are. And like, are you a, like, uh, you know, we're going to take everyone to the Caribbean for a retreat company, in which case that works for you. Like, you go do that. If you, are you a, like, we're going to keep everyone in the office forever company? Go do that. Lots of places there. Um, I also think kind of in the, and like, I think being an entrepreneur, it's this, there's this tension between like, you're supposed to be a founder and visionary and like, um, kind of like difficult to deal with sometimes because you like have this goal and you're like merging mercilessly towards it. And parts of that are all true. And then there's also a like flexibility in being like, oh, 2021 with grow, grow, grow. 2022 is like, 
be very prudent about all things. And you have to have that like flexibility and shift. And so they're, you know, kind of just figuring out like when to be stubborn and when to play the game on the field. Mm -hmm. Now, were investors even asking for burn rate before Last year, this? no. <laughs> well, they weren't so, even asking. They didn't, they weren't interested in your I mean, I think they'd ask and then be like, they oh, just, cool. No, they just, just wanted like, to know revenue. Yeah, you think they'd ask and then, you know, might be like, oh, you know, you have 60% growth margins. Like industry standard is 80%. And the entrepreneur would be like, yes, and here's my like wonderful plan to get there. And it'd be like, oh, that sounds logical. Cool. Right. I mean, we're the good wow. version of that conversation, but like, oh, you have a, I asked, you have a plan, but like, I gotta believe you'll execute it on it, but like, cool, sounds good. Right. Whereas this year, it's more like, why isn't that number better? Come back when the number is better. Wow. That is, that, I mean, it does sound like it's a palpable change, especially because, you know, your first, your series A was in May of 2021, and then your series B was in June. Yeah. Pretty deep into a <laughs> slowdown. I mean, that, yeah. it, it I don't think it's gotten better than since then, but like yeah. that is a big, that sounds like a pretty stark difference in a very short amount of time. Yeah. Has that fluctuated at all? I mean, you, you've, you've been in Silicon Valley for a while. Was 2021 exceptionally high or was it just kind of continuous to 2021 and now it's like. Pfft. Oh, interesting. Um, I think so. I think some of this, honestly, and especially early 2021 was, um, uh, just everyone had been, you know, cooped up in their house for like nine months and kind of bored. Like we'd all made sourdough a bunch of times, you know, like everyone was bored at that point. And so literally I think VCs were just like, okay, now I'm ready to like do some deals because <laughs> I've been sitting, like I'm over the sourdough thing. And then there was just this like snowball that started rolling. So, you know, 2021, I think was like a like, continuation of, you know, maybe more in 2019, but it did just feel like this extra click up. Um, and I think it was because 2020 was like so out of sorts and it felt like everyone had like time to make up and like ground to make up. Yeah. A bunch of like pent up, pent up energy. Pent up energy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, like probably some pent up ideas that, yeah. that were kind of germinating in that 2020 like lockdown, right. literally, and then kind of had its chance to breathe um, only to hit this year. Yeah. Now, experts say that the market is probably unlikely to improve anytime soon. In fact, we could be getting worse. <laughs> we could be in this for years. Um, what advice do you have for either you know established startups or just new up and coming ones? When you're that's the time frame you're looking at. You can't just be like, yeah, okay, yeah. well, we can pitter through like, you know, a few months, maybe 2023 fall by then. It'll it's like right. and I know if you've got like a few years how do you brace for and respond to that kind of sluggishness? Yeah, so I think one piece of advice I got that again sounds kind of stupid almost, but it's actually very good, which is like, just don't run out of money, but actually, right? Which is kind of harder than it says, especially when no one wants to fund you. And so in the vein of not running out of money, you know, you will probably hire slower, you will probably spend less on marketing, you might take more aggressive stances on performance management, whatever. Like, there's, get smaller offices, cut offices, whatever. Like there's a bunch of stuff, but there is just this bit of like the startups that survive are in fact the startups that survive. And so don't run out of money. Um, which again, I actually think it's like much more profound than the kind of silly, silly statement is. Well, I mean, that, I don't know that it is. I mean, yeah. especially if there has been a lot more flexibility with your margins previously, then it's like, if you've gotten used to that flexibility being yeah. available and being okay, and something that you can rely on bouncing back from just as long as you have a plan, yep. um, that it is kind of groundbreaking to be like, no, you really can't run out of money. Yeah, yeah, like someone will not come in and save you with financing, or if they do, it's going to be on terms that you very much do not like and probably will not want to take. Right, And so right. like, don't put yourself in that corner. No, I mean, when we are talking about these things is sort of like, well, this is, these are fundamentals. Like, yeah, I don't run out of money. I mean, it isn't like a, Right. <laughs> it, it's in a, some of these just basic rules of man, managing money that you do like as a, as a household yep. or as a child with allowance that you right. don't spend money you don't have. Um, is there, I mean, it's again, I don't mean to make it sound like this is a good thing, um, but is it a little bit relaxing or a relief <laughs> to not have to put on as much of a show of... Yeah of spending? Yeah, I like this. I, and all the ways 2022 is hard. I like it way more than last year. Um, 
because I think it is, again, much more about like, what business are you building? What do you need to do that? Um, and then please do that than be like, oh, and by the way, you know, your competitors hired 67 people last week and like, what are you doing? And you're like, oh shoot, we should probably hire more than two. You know, it's like, again, that's a little bit of a joke, but there's actually real stuff behind it. And you know, when everyone is like putting up billboards and you're like, oh, should I put up billboards too? Maybe you don't wanna be left behind. Um, I actually find, yeah, I find this environment as hard as it is in some ways, actually a lot, a lot easier because it's more clarifying. It is just clearer what you need to do and like stuff that last year you were like, is this noise or is it real? It's just easier to see as noise. No, I think that to us that are outside of the industry, there is kind of a, a caricature of, of the founder, um, the Silicon Valley founder, and some of the personality traits in that caricature don't seem to align very well with what's coming. Like, do you see this potential long-term slowdown in financing changing like the type of person that we associate with found being a founder? I don't know. I think like, you know, shows like the dropout, we were talking about this earlier, <laughs> like will still exist because those stories will still happen and they are so, I mean, they're terrible, but also so good, right? Like those yeah. are the stories people like telling. So I think we will, I, fortunately and unfortunately still have the absurd stories to like laugh slash cry over. Um, I do think there is probably a like, just like it's back to the flexibility point. It's like figuring out sort of what hat to wear or like what mode to take when. Do you think that a lot of founders are ready to kind of reshape their own image in that way? I think we're all getting told that by investors, which feels a little rich sometimes, but also I think it's good <laughs> advice, you know, it is, it's both. Um, it's like, hey, last year you're telling me to grow, 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 this year you're not. But there's, there's reasons for that switch, again, back to the flexibility point. Um, you know, uh, we work with Sequoia and they did a presentation for their um, CEOs in probably mid to late May. And basically their message was, this is an economic downturn, it will be long, everything is changing and you can adapt or your company will perish. <laughs> Thank you for attending our webinar. <laughs> like literally kind of. <laughs> and you know, that's like an extreme point of view, but I think that's probably like, whatever's gonna play out is like more on that side of the spectrum than, than like, it's all gonna bounce back the way it kind of did after 2020. Now, since people went to work from home um, in 2020, and it's, it's been a couple of years now, um, it, is it, are we ever gonna get to the point where Silicon Valley isn't the center of it? Like, that it isn't like this contained culture, yeah. that it isn't that the expectations and norms and how, you know, business is done and business businesses present themselves, is it gonna be in less of a silo eventually? Because it doesn't feel like it's changed yet. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'd be curious, that, again, y'all in Utah would have a much better sense of this than I have in California. My sense is, you know, Silicon Valley is like a mindset, is very persistent as a geographic place. The pandemic dented pretty hard. Um, and I think like a lot of the folks who left will come back slash, you know, folks coming out of school will still want to move to the Bay Area. And so, you know, it's not like Bay Area housing or anything is gonna get any better. Like, I don't think that. But I do think the place has lost some of its actual like geographic center of gravity. And so I think, you know, places like Utah, New York City, Austin, Miami, if they can get, get through their hype cycle, like are actually more likely to, to maybe not be on par with the Bay Area or Silicon Valley, but be incredible places to start and build companies. Do you think that will eventually kind of diffuse the um, kind of Silicon Valley cultural quirks yeah. in how business is conducted? Yeah, I kind of do. Yeah. And I think it'll be less or like maybe, maybe, you know, in 20 years, people will know it was from Silicon Valley. And maybe it's just like, nope, it's open plan offices everywhere. And, you know, the pros and cons and people will complain about the noise level. But like, there'll be more of those than, you know, private offices is one just specific example. For sure. For sure. Well, um, I can see that we are fast running out of time here. Can you think of, I guess, anything else that I, I think especially that a new founder should know as they approach, they do have a good idea and yeah. they're willing to work hard and they're willing to do all the, you know, they aren't even, maybe they weren't interested in the, the show, the game of mm -hmm. before, um, but it's just, I mean, seed money's 
tough to come by. They may not have the resources to bootstrap. Like, yep. do you just give up and wait five years or what do you do at that point? No, I think, I mean, it's also a trope, but I do believe it. I think downturns are great times to start companies because the hardest things are, you're going to a different set of things that are hard than in boom times. And the discipline you learn and kind of have to bake into the company early on because it's a rougher time will just serve you well as you grow and the stuff is harder to retrofit later. Um, so I think, I think that I also think that, yeah, there is just no substitute for customers, right? And so, the, again, the best way to get someone to fund you is to kind of not need it. And so whether that's customer revenue or customers liking you so much, that is just like so compelling even in a time where, again, folks are more skeptical, it's just hard to argue with the reality of, again, people use like spending time, money, whatever it is with your product. Now, I, I have one more question to kind of focus it back in. We've talked a lot about just kind of being conservative, modest, disciplined, steady, as opposed to mm -hmm. volatile. Um, at what point in Vanta's development did you feel most tempted to move forward faster than you were? Oh, last year, uh, like the second half of last year. And it was like very much a game on the field, right? Like the game on the field, what the other startups were doing, what like nascent competitors were doing was seeming to hire really fast and like spend on all this marketing stuff and like, ah, they're everywhere. Um, and it was like, well, I don't want to do that, but you have to play the game on the field. And so very much the second half of last year. Yeah, I, I yeah. can see that, especially coming, you know, a couple months off of the Series A and, you know, tapping into that resource yeah. as well. It was still there. Well, are you, are you glad you didn't now? Or are oh, you? yeah, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> like, again, I prefer this. All right. Different trade-offs, but yeah, prefer these. Awesome. Well, Christina, thank you so much today. This has really been fascinating and kind of eye-opening for me, and I hope, like, useful and I know we're doing gloom, but like maybe confidence inspiring and making people feel like there are, are actually paths forward um, that are available to anybody who's kind of willing to take a close eye and be a little bit fierce with uh, <laughs> where they're spending their money. So I think that this is really helpful and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. This was really fun. Awesome. Thank you.